Hello friends and welcome to this 3 ABM Sabbath School panel. My name is James Rafferty and we are in lesson number nine entitled Blessed is He that Comes in the Name of the Lord. Before I introduce the panel, let me just remind you that we are now making available the notes, that is the additional notes that we add to each day's lesson. And those notes are available to you now if you want to email ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. You can get a copy of the individual notes that each one of us shares each week. ssp at 3abn.org. Now, before we get started on our lesson, let me introduce our panel. To my immediate left is Jill Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James. On Monday, we look at the suffering Messiah. Amen. And to your left, Shelley Quinn. We get to talk about one of my favorite topics, forever faithful to his covenant. Amen. And to your left, Pastor John Dinsey. Pastor James, I have Wednesday, eternal king of unrivaled power. Amen. Mm. And to your left, Professor Daniel Perrin. For Thursday, eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. Amen, amen. So glad each one of you are with us and so glad that you have joined us. Before we get started on our lesson, I'm gonna ask Pastor John Dinsey to have prayer for us. Sure, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace in Jesus' name. We ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit, for we desperately need your Holy Spirit, Lord, to bring the message your children need. We ask that you will give us the words to speak. We ask that those that are listening will receive the blessing of understanding and be drawn close to you. We ask you for these things in the holy and mm -hmm. blessed name of Jesus, amen. amen. Amen, amen. So I have Sabbath and Sunday's lesson and we're actually gonna spend most of our time on Sabbath's lesson because the emphasis is so beautiful and so powerful. So if you don't uh, mind, we'll focus on Sabbath's lesson and you can study Sunday's lesson uh, for yourself. Sabbath's lesson begins uh, with a memory text and that memory text is found in Psalm 118 verses 22 and 23. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In fact, the whole week we're gonna be looking at Psalm 23, John chapter 10, 11 through 15, Psalm 22, Psalm 89, 27 to 32, Colossians 1, 16, Psalm 2, and Hebrews 7, 10 to 28. We, we really believe in studying the Bible on the Sabbath school uh, panel. And so we're gonna be looking at the scriptures, opening the Bible, comparing the New Testament with the Old Testament in specific, specifically in the book of Psalms. The Psalms testify, the lesson quarter he says about Christ's person and ministry, almost all aspects of his work in the plan of salvation are seen in the Psalms. In various ways, Christ's life war and work are prefigured, mm. predicted in, and often remark uh, given with remarkable accuracy. So the Psalms really tell us about Jesus. That's right. And that's one of the reasons why when Jesus was resurrected on the road to Emmaus, speaking to those two disciples, and then meeting with the disciples, he specifically emphasized in Luke 24, verse 44, that he was explaining to them the things concerning himself from the writings of Moses and specifically from the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with topics that reveal Christ's deity, his sonship, his obedience, the quarterly goes on to say, his zeal for God's temple, his identity as God's good shepherd, his betrayal, his sufferings, his bones not being broken, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his priesthood, his kingship. It's all there as predicted many centuries before Jesus came in the flesh. So some of the Psalms uh, that have a uh, typolo typological fulfillment in Christ includes Psalms 24, Psalm 45, Psalm 72, Psalm 101, and then uh, Psalm 88 and Psalm 102 reveal the prayers and sufferings of the servant of God. In all the Psalms, the quarterly continues to say, through the psalmist laments, thanksgivings, praises, and cries for justice and deliverance, we can hear the echoes of Christ's prayer for the salvation of the world. So Sunday's lesson, we're just gonna be looking at Christ's ministry as it's portrayed through the Psalms. And it's really powerful. For example, let's start in Psalm 38 and verse 12. And we'll ask the question, as Christ begins his public ministry, how do the religious leaders respond? Does the, do the Psalms tell us the interaction of the religious leaders with Christ? Psalm 38 verse 12 says, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me and they seek my hurt 
O oh, they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. So here we see the interaction with the leaders, the religious leaders in Christ. They were laying snares for him. They were trying to find things, mischievous things, and they were imagining deceits all the day long yeah. to try to undermine Christ's ministry. Psalm 38, verse 12. How about Psalm 39, verse 2? It says here, and we're going to ask the question with some exceptions when necessary, how does Jesus genuinely respond to the hypocrisy and the betrayal and the attitude of those that misjudge him? Psalm 39 verse 2 says, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. Now let me just share with you a couple of statements here from the Desire of Ages regarding this in relationship to the life of Christ and how he related to people who were seeking uh, to uh, misjudge him, to betray him, who were acting with hypocrisy toward him. For example, when Jesus went to Lazarus, when he went to raise Lazarus from the grave, there were a lot of Jews there. There were a lot of people that Lazarus and his sisters knew that were also enemies of Christ. And they were there to mourn Lazarus. They were there to, to act as though they, you know, had this um, sorrow for the death of Lazarus. Secretly, though, they were uh, acting hypo with hypocrisy. All right, so when Jesus saw uh, Mary weeping and the Jews weeping also, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. He read the hearts of all who were assembled. He saw that with many, what passed as a demonstration of grief was only pretense. Mm. He knew that some in the company now manifesting hypocritical sorrow would ere long be planning the death, not only of the mighty miracle worker, but also of the one to be raised from the dead. Christ could have stripped from them their robe of pretended sorrow but he restrained his righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. The Bible verse we read says, he held his peace even from good, that is from righteous indignation, right? Psalm 39 verse two, he restrained his righteous indignation. The words he could in all truth have spoken, he did not speak mm -hmm. because of the loved one kneeling at his feet in sorrow who truly believed in him. How about in the feast at Simon's house? You know, Simon was a leper. He was also a Pharisee. He professed to believe in Jesus, but he still had some thoughts in his hearts, some questions about Christ. And Mary comes in and she anoints Christ's uh, head and feet with ointment and, and, and uh, Simon starts judging her and really judging Christ. You know, when, when, when we are judged, when God's church is judged, when the woman is judged, Christ is also judged. You know, this man, if he were a prophet, would know what kind of woman this is for she is a sinner. Mary's act, it says here in the Desire of Ages 563, was in marked contrast with that which Judas was about to do. What a sharp lesson Christ might have given to him who had dropped the seed of criticism and evil thinking into the minds of the disciples. How justly the accuser might have been accused. He who reads the motives of the, every heart and understood stood every action or understands every action might have opened before uh, those at the feast dark chapters in the experience of Judas, excuse me, I was talking about Judas here, not Simon, I've mentioned Simon. Here comes Simon. Simon was also touched by the kindness of Jesus in not openly rebuking him before the guests. That's Desire of Ages 563, 567, and 568. So Jesus Christ could have opened up and exposed the hypocrisy of Judas, the hypocrisy of Simon before the guests, but he doesn't. He actually holds back, as it says there again in Psalm 39, verse 2, he held his peace even from good, even though his sorrow was stirred within him. And also, as Christ's influence grows, what tactics are used to misrepresent Jesus before the people? This is Psalm 56, verse 5. Psalm 56, verse 5, and we're going to look at this from the New King James Version. What tactics were used to misrepresent Jesus before the people as his influence grows? Notice what it says here in Psalm 56, verse 5. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. Now let's just read this from the Desire of Ages 534 and 535. In the past, the Pharisees had circulated false statements regarding the most wonderful manifestations of the power of God. When Christ raised to life the daughter of Jer Jairus, he had said the damsel is not dead but sleeps, Mark 539. As she had only been sick for a short time and was raised immediately after death, the Pharisees declared that the child had not been dead, that, they, that Christ himself had said she, would only, she was only asleep. They had tried to make it appear that Christ could not cure disease, that there was foul play about his miracles. Remember, all the day they twist my words, all their thoughts 
are against me for evil, Psalm 56, verse 5. By misconstruing his words, they hope to prejudice the people against in the Desire of Ages, page 389. Okay, how about Psalm 31, verse 13? Here's another one that depicts the ministry of Christ, Psalm 31, verse 13. And so, what is the, this would depict what the final determination of the leaders of Israel are as nothing else seems to deter him or stop him. They are trying to twist his words, they're trying to misrepresent him, and finally they decide to do what, according to Psalm 31, verse 13? For I've heard the slander of many, fear was on every side, while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. Yeah. So they're slandering him, there's fear on every side. People are, are afraid to even uh, acknowledge him for fear that they'll be kicked out of the church, right? And then finally they decide to take his life according to Psalm 31 verse 13. Notice what it says in the Desire of Ages 538 and 539. So as the priests and the rulers and the elders gathered, gathered for consultation, it was their fixed determination to silence him who did such marvelous works that all men wondered. They were gonna mm. put him to death. Or how about Psalm 40, verses 9 and 10? Again, this is the New King James Version. Despite this deadly opposition raised against Jesus, what does he do? Psalm 40, verses 9 and 10. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Even though his life is at stake, Jesus Christ continues to proclaim the message of Christ's righteousness, the everlasting gospel. And this is an example for us, especially in these last days. We need to continue to proclaim the the everlasting gospel. Desire of Ages 452. This will be our last statement. In the midst of the feast, when the excitement concerning him was at its height, he, Jesus, entered the court of the temple in the presence of the multitude. Standing thus the center of attraction to the vast throng, Jesus addressed them as no man had ever done. His words showed a knowledge of the laws and institutions of Israel, of the sacrificial service and the teachings of the prophets, far exceeding that of the priests and of the rabbis. So, Christ's life is on the line here. They're seeking to take his life. In fact, the people at this feast think, oh, Christ isn't gonna come here because if he came here, they would, they would kill him for sure. And there he is, he shows up right in the middle of this great feast and he begins to proclaim the everlasting gospel. He begins to give them revelations of truth that go far beyond the understanding of the priests and of the rabbis and he begins to minister to the people. So the life of Christ powerfully illustrated in the Psalms foretold by the psalmist David, the, the, the one who was called, or Jesus who was called the son of David for good reason, because truly David prophesied of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen, thank you so much, Pastor James. What an incredible study. You know, as I was listening, I was thinking there's so much that we can glean from and gain as Christians in these last days from the example of Jesus. Mm -hmm. My lesson continues with the example of Jesus on the cross. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at the suffering Messiah. And we're gonna take a look at Psalm 22. Now, I know some of the Psalms that we've been studying, other people have covered in previous lessons. I think Daniel Perrin had Psalm 22 on a previous lesson, and it was an incredible study, so you can go back and listen to that as well. We're gonna look at it from a slightly different perspective. Psalm 22, the suffering Messiah. We look at David foretelling the coming Messiah and his suffering on the cross, mm -hmm. and we see the fulfillment. What we're gonna do is take a look at a few different verses. We will study New Testament, Christ's fulfillment of those prophecies, and then some practical application for you and I today. Psalm 22 to 24 is kind of a triad of Psalms. They're all messianic in nature. Psalm 22, of course, is the Psalm of the Cross. Psalm 23, the Psalm of the Grave. Now you might say, wait a minute, Psalm 23 is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it's all about the Good Shepherd. And it most certainly is. Jesus is our Good Shepherd. But you can also look at it eschatologically. The sheep will be the righteous one who goes through the valley of the shadow of death. 
ultimately pointing forward to the righteous, mm -hmm. dying Lamb mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. Then on Psalm 24, we see the Psalm of the Crown. This is the coronation of Jesus, the risen one. Mm -hmm. But we're focused specifically this lesson on Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was sung in the temple during the morning sacrifice of the Lamb, but it points forward to the coming suffering Messiah, portrays his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and the accomplished mission of the Messiah. So turn to Psalm 22, and most of our New Testament fulfillment will be in Matthew 27. So you can kind of keep your finger in both passages. We'll be going back and forth. Well, let's start with Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. Jesus quoted from this psalm in Matthew 27, verse 46. We see the fulfillment when he's hanging on the cross. And says at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama. Sabachthani. Sabachthani. Thank you. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? An exact quote from Psalm 22, verse 1. This is the ultimate separation of Jesus from his Father. This is the second death experience that you and I will not have to go through if Amen. we accept Amen. and receive Jesus. You know, I think the pain of the separation of Jesus from his Father, besides that ultimate second death experience, complete and total separation from his Father, I think it's even more painful because they were one from the beginning. Mm -hmm. For all eternity, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They were united. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. So you go from such oneness to complete and total separation from God. I can't even imagine what that would have felt like. You know, in a marriage, if you're struggling in a marriage and you have a separation from your spouse, it might not bother you. Oh, good riddance, thank you, I get a little space. But if you have a close marriage, mm -hmm. You're married to your best friend. Separation is agony. Mm -hmm. The closer you are to someone, the more painful the separation. Jesus went through that for you and for me. What is our present day application? Here's a takeaway. Christ experienced the second death so that you and I don't have to. All we have to do is confess our sins and forsake them. He cleanses, he forgives, he restores. We never have to experience what he went through on the cross for you and for me. Takeaway number two, in your pain, turn toward God. Many times we run from God in pain, in hurt, in confusion, in bewilderment. You see, even Jesus experiencing that ultimate second death, that separation, he turns toward God and he cries out toward God. Let's look at Psalm 22 verses four and five. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. Mm -hmm. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. What is happening here? This is for Christ, but it's also for us today. Takeaway three, recount what God has done in the past. Mm -hmm. Remember those past victories. Remember the ways that he has delivered you and me. It gives us hope when everything is dark. Let's look at verse six. We're in Psalm 22, verse six. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Man, that's you and I. Humanity is by nature a worm. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. Job 25, verse six. How much less man who is a maggot? Mm -hmm. and a son of man mm -hmm. who is a worm. You see, Christ lowered himself. We talked about this on previous lessons. You find it in Philippians 2. From God, he lowered himself to the point of humanity, lower than the angels, taking upon him the form of man, then submitting to death, and not just any death, mm -hmm. but death on the cross. He became, as it were, a worm for you and for me. Let's look at verses seven and eight. We're in Psalm 22, seven and eight. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, 
what's the fulfillment of that? Let's pause for just a moment. Matthew 27, 39. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads. What does it say? They shook their head. And what did they say? Back to Psalm 22, verse 8. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Did that happen to Jesus on the cross? We see that back again in Matthew 27, verse 42. What did the people say? He saved others. Himself he cannot save. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. Wow. What's our present day application for that? Your identity and value, it comes from God not from others. You see, Jesus knew who he was. He knew why he had come to this earth. Mm -hmm. He knew whose he was. And he, the opinions of those around the cross, even his seeming separation from God, none of that mattered because he knew in his heart what his value came from. And you and I, what other people say doesn't matter. What other people think doesn't matter. If they wag their head, mm -hmm. if they talk, that doesn't matter. We look to Jesus. Yeah. What does matter? That is what matters. Let's look back at Psalm 22, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Mm. The fulfillment is in John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Mm -hmm. What's our present day application? When everything turns to dust, turn to Jesus, the water of life. Mm -hmm. You and I don't have to be dry and thirsty. We don't have to have our tongue cling to our jaws as it talked about in Psalm 22. We turn to Jesus, the water of life. Remember in John 7, Jesus at the feast and standing there. What did he say? Out of me will flow rivers of water. He is the water of life. When everything around you is crumbling, turn to Jesus, the water of life. Let's go back to Psalm 22, verse 16. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Of course, we see the fulfillment where they <coughs> crucified him. And we also see where Thomas says, let me put my hands in your side. They pierced my hands and my feet. What's our present day application? Jesus understands our pain. He knows what it's like to have dogs surround you. He knows what it's like to experience emotional and physical pain. He has been tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He is able to help and deliver you and I. Amen. Verse 18, Psalm 22, 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And you see that fulfillment in Matthew 27, 35, mm -hmm. where they divided his garments and cast lots for the garment of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Present day application. The garment of Christ's righteousness is worth everything. Mm -hmm. That garment that he gave and extended freely to you and to me on the cross, you and I can take and put on mm -hmm. and wear and be clothed in his righteousness. Psalm 22 ends, it goes from suffering to praise, mm. to a God who has not hidden his face. And I love that especially we can praise the God when we have experienced his silence and then we experience subsequent deliverance. That's a tremendous witness. Amen. Hey. Amen. Thank you yeah. so much, Jill. That is powerful. The Psalms speak to Jesus Christ. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello, friends. Welcome back. We are now handing it over to Shelley for Tuesday's lesson. And Tuesday's lesson is forever faithful to his covenant. You may want to open your Bibles to Psalm 89. I am Shelley Quinn. If you know me at all, you know that 
God's covenant is my favorite topic. Psalm 89 verses 3 and 4. It says, I have made a covenant. This is God speaking with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant, David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah, which means pause and meditate on this. And we're going to because seed is covenant language here. And to understand covenant language, you've got to understand the writings of Moses. Jesus told us this, John 5, 46 through 47. He told the Pharisees, if you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Moses introduces covenant language. And if you don't understand covenant language, the rest of the Bible won't make sense to you. He uses seed, righteousness by faith, firstborn, begotten, the son of God, the only begotten and father. And we've got to understand those from a covenant aspect. God introduced his everlasting covenant, the grace that was given to us before time began in Christ Jesus. He introduced that in the Garden of Eden. Let me read it real quick. Genesis 3, 15. God says, he's speaking to the serpent. This is Satan who has masqueraded as an angel of light in this beautiful serpent. You know, the serpent wasn't a snake that crawled on its belly till after the curse of sin. But in Genesis 3, 15, he's talking to this serpent who has tempted Eve and Adam wasn't deceived, mm -hmm. but Adam followed along. And he says to the serpent, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. So seed, when you read it in the Old Testament, Seed can refer to descendants, Abraham's seed, David's seed. But when it's covenant language, and this is covenant language in Genesis 3.15, her seed, the seed of the woman, capital S, the seed is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the story of the seed progressively unfolds throughout scripture. The New Testament affirms that Jesus is the seed. Galatians 3, 16, he's the seed of Abraham. Luke 1, 31 through 33, he's the seed of David. Listen, Luke 1, 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. So seed from Psalm 89, when God is making this everlasting covenant, the seed is the Messiah Christ who will reign on his David's throne forever. Mm. Firstborn in scripture can indicate the order of birth, but in covenant language, firstborn means a position of preeminence. Let's look at Exodus 4, 22, 23 real quickly. The Lord says, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So he's telling this to Pharaoh, I say to you, Pharaoh, let my son go that he may serve me. Israel was not the first nation. God ranked Israel as his firstborn son because they held a position of preeminence in the everlasting covenant. Now, chronologically, when we're thinking of David, David was the eighth to be born to Jesse. But listen to Psalm 89, 26 and 23. And God here is speaking of David. He shall cry to me. You are my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. And then God says, I will make him my firstborn. Hmm. That's covenant language for preeminence. 
the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep with him forever and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. I won't take time, but whatever God says to David or to Solomon can be applied to Jesus as well. Let me, let me just explain this because so many people have got a, a misunderstanding that the covenant was a contract. Mm. God doesn't make contracts with human beings. The covenant describes a legally binding agreement. God had two kinds of covenants that he made, unilateral, which meant no human had to respond to him, and bilateral, which means God still makes and keeps all of the promises, but it required a human response. The everlasting covenant of salvation by grace is bilateral. God makes and keeps all of the promises, but we've got to receive them. Yeah. It requires a human response. Unilateral, the covenant with Noah, when or he introduced to Noah, about not flooding the earth again or destroying the earth with water and gave the rainbow. But the other unilateral is the Davidic covenant, God's oath bound promise that the seed of David would sit on the throne forever. It's, it's interesting. We find that in First Chronicles 17, 11 through 14, by the way. But in Psalm 89, what we see in Psalm 89, we won't go there right now, but it's lamenting over the harsh reality that seems to indicate the glorious promises made to David in the Davidic covenant, what God promised that they'd been lost because the seed of David in his descendants had not remained faithful. But you see, the Davidic covenant was unilateral. God's unchanging purpose through the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So it didn't require, even though the humans were not faithful, it was the Messiah who embodied all of the righteousness and the salvation for the whole world. The oath bound promise God is saying he will prevail. His eternal kingdom will be established forever, not because of the people, but because of Jesus Christ, who is the root of Jesse. That means he's the beginning of Jesse, and yet he's King David's father too. And he, he came coming from that decayed root of the Davidic line. Who would have thought that this babe that is born the, who becomes the firstborn preeminent of God, the preeminent covenant blessing. Who would have thought that he was actually the Messiah? Let's look at Colossians 1, 15 and 16. So here we've got a baby born in a manger who's going to reign on the throne of David forever. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That means he's preeminent. Mm -hmm. That's covenant language. Christ is preeminent over all. He is superior to all. He is the creator of all. And here's what it says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created for him and through him. So God made Jesus the supreme king over all the world when he raised him from the dead. In Psalm 2, 7, God says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. We see that in Hebrews 1, 5 through 6. It says, to which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son. Today I've begotten you. Jesus Christ is the firstborn son of God, just as Israel was the firstborn son of God. These are covenant terms because right there in Hebrews 1, 8, to the son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. 
is the scepter of your kingdom. Amen, amen. You ran out of time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is John Dinsey. We're now in Wednesday's portion, Eternal King of Unrivaled Power. We hope that next time you have more time. <laughs> Let's go now into this lesson here uh, for Wednesday has many scriptures and we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Uh, for, for example, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Psalm 89, 4, 13 through 17. We're going to stay with Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 if we can. Now here we, we begin Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Uh, you can look, some consider this Psalm 2 as the first messianic Psalm, but obviously this is talking about Jesus when it says his anointed and that they plot a vain thing. Didn't they plot vain things against Jesus? Mm -hmm. Now I take you to the time when Jesus was crucified and he was already dead and he was in the tomb and the priest began to wonder, boy, they, you know, they were talking about that he was going to be resurrected from the dead. We need to do something about this. Now, this is Matthew 27, uh, beginning in verse 62. Now, the next day they followed the day of the preparation. What day is that? Sabbath, Saturday. The chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. They're plotting a vain thing, saying, sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. What they did not know and apparently decided to ignore the scriptures is that Christ will be resurrected from the dead. And of course, you can continue reading in Matthew 27 and you will see that that is exactly what occurred. And most people know that, but we don't know who is listening. And there may be people different understanding or uh, just beginning in the scriptures. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. This was a vain thing they planned. There was no way they could prevent Jesus Christ from coming up from the grave. Even the devil uh, could, with all his demons, could stand there and try to prevent, but he could not prevent what God had already established and that the grave cannot hold Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 2, and now we are in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall hold them in derision. And this is obviously what happens because Jesus Christ came from the grave, and because He came up from the grave, you and I have the blessed hope, the blessed hope. Amen. I read to you from Desire of Ages, page, page 778. So weak men counseled and planned little, did these murderers realize the uselessness of their efforts, but by their, dis their action, God was glorified. The very efforts made to prevent Christ's resurrection are the most convincing argument in its proof. Mm -hmm. The greater the number of soldiers placed around the tomb, the stronger would be the testimony mm -hmm. that He had risen. Hundreds of years before the death of Christ, the Holy Spirit had declared through the psalmist, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord, the Lord shall have them in derision. Mm. Uh, and so we see that this is exactly what happened. Uh, continuing here, it says, the Roman guards and Roman arms were powerless to confine the Lord of life within the tomb. The hour of His release was near. Mm -hmm. And praise the Lord, mm -hmm. Jesus came up from that grave. Mm -hmm. And that's a promise that those that have died in Jesus will come up from the grave as well. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm chapter 2, uh, Psalm 2, verse 5. Then He shall speak to them in His wrath and distress, 
them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Yes, an eternal king, that is Jesus. It says in verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Interesting, we have in Acts chapter uh, 13, uh, beginning in verse 32, a, a uh, quoting of this. Uh, let's begin there. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So you see, the Psalms are full of Jesus. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, talking about Jesus, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This is a quoting uh, of uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, mm -hmm. that we read it a moment ago. And uh, as we also read in Acts 13, 23, but this last part where it says, uh, I will be to him a father and, to, uh, and he shall be to me a son is from 1 Chronicles 17, 13. Now, uh, boy, it's almost hard to resist. Mm. Let's do it. Let's go to Luke 24. <laughs> Let's go to Luke 24, uh, verse 15. This is uh, on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Uh, we bring this to your attention because Jesus said something important that we are bringing to your attention. Uh, so these two guys were walking uh, and they were discussing what had happened and they were, uh, they were depressed, I could say, sorrowful. And it says in verse 15, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Wow, mm. Jesus said, if two of you are together, I will come and he's here. Uh, verse 16, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Mm -hmm. And they began to tell him things, you know, concerning uh, what had happened. And I pick up in verse 24, and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Mm -hmm. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them uh, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so uh, even in mentioned Psalms. And so here we have Jesus talking to his disciples that yes, this was prophesied. I mean, yes, these things had to take place. And Psalm 2, verse 8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Have you ever rejoiced with trembling? Mm -hmm. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. These things are talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. ah, we need to move to Psalm 110, at least read one verse. It says, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is also concerning Jesus. Time does not permit us to talk too much about that, but uh, I uh, 
want to let you know that this is exactly what Jesus quoted in Matthew 22 as he was talking to the Pharisees. And uh, let me begin reading there, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. He said unto them, How then does David said in spirit, calling him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? <laughs> and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Jesus asked some good questions. Mm -hmm. So all of these things speak about Jesus even in the Psalms. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, I am saddened by the fact that we are going to come to the end of this time of talking about Jesus in the Psalms, but you don't have to. <laughs> you can keep on looking at Jesus in the Psalms and all the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to run out of time too, but I'm picking <laughs> up where you left off. Tell me more about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the answer is given. God says, read Psalm 110. And if you sit next to me here, you know that like others, I write all over my Bible. I mark, I highlight, I add notes. But in the Psalms, there are two Psalms. I just, I can't write anything there. It's just, I, I cannot, I cannot mess with anything that is there. Psalm 110 and Psalm 23 are those two. I just, I don't underline anything. I just look at it. These are the most, this Psalm here is the most quoted of the Psalms in the New Testament. Peter in Acts 2 verses 3 to 4 uses it to show the deity and ascension of Jesus. Jesus quotes it in Matthew 22, 41, 43 to 45, also in Mark and Luke, where David shows the Messiah is greater than himself. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 uses it to show the rule and dominion of Jesus, the Messiah. Paul in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13, showing that Jesus is superior to the angels. And then referenced again in Hebrews 10, 13 and other places as well. Let's look at this Psalm 110. I hope you're there. I've given you time to open your Bible. King David was a musician and a warrior, a king, a ruler, but he was also a prophet mm -hmm. who, when under the influence of the Holy Spirit, spoke and wrote prophetically. Mm -hmm. So in verse 1 of chapter of Psalm 110, David is overhearing a conversation a conversation that happens in heaven. And it doesn't tell us when, and it starts out like this. The Lord said to my Lord, and perhaps nowhere else in the Bible is knowing David's authorship more important than this. We know that David is not the Lord. That is in all caps there. That is Yahweh. That is God eternal. That is, in this case, God the Father. And we know that David is not my Lord because he's not speaking of himself. And Jesus confirms when he references this in Matthew 22, 41 to 45, that this is a conversation between God the Father mm. and God the Son, the Messiah. So what is it that Yahweh, God the Father, says to Jesus, the Messiah? Verse 1, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Mm -hmm. This is the enthronement. This is Jesus installed as king and rightful ruler because he is victor, because he has conquered, and the rightful place is given to him. And wrapped up with this is the whole incarnation where Jesus leaves the heavenly courts and he takes on our human nature and he places himself in our spot, taking our penalty of sin as the only begotten Son of God. And so this prophetic picture shows the Messiah's ascension and resurrection where he is given the rightful rule because of what he's done. And so all the texts in the Bible that refer to Jesus sitting at the right hand of God are alluding back to this conversation that David overhears in advance before it ever happened. Confirmed in advance. Keep going to verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. By God's eternal plan, the authority of Jesus is not geographically limited to Israel. That, that territory, it goes out from there. This is an eternal, universal right to rule extending to you and me right now. Verse 3, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. We probably pass by this text thinking, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. But here, the Savior is promised that his people, through what he does, will be saved. And in all places, 
God calls then for volunteers. The King James Version says, thy people shall be willing. Mm -hmm. They have seen the beauties of his holiness, all that Jesus has done. And in the day of his power, that word is army. When Jesus, the captain calls together his workers, they willingly, not as slaves, not as paid workers, they join him for the glorious task of participating in what he has already victoriously completed. Amen like the fresh dew on the ground that has not melted away. It vastly covers everything and it is vigorous. God's army will conquer. Hmm. Now the scene changes in verse four. Something different happens. Verse four, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. We weren't expecting this part. The declaration in verse one was already irrevocable, but here the strongest language possible is used that Yahweh has sworn. He pledges on his good name and character, laying it all on the line and he will never go back on this or any other of his promises. And so what is this great assurance that deserves this absolute confirmation? You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Here comes this name popping up in Paul in Hebrews, part of chapter five and part of chapter six and most of chapter seven, unpacking this verse of the Bible right here, saying that the Messiah will not just be a king to rule, he's going to be the high priest. Ah, well, any person knowing the Old Testament would look at this and say, you can't do that. You can't have a king and a priest together. They just, they're, they're totally separate. Look at 2 Chronicles 26, 16 to 21. When King Uzziah, he tried to do this, the king goes in to burn incense and he breaks out in leprosy. You can't do that. So how could the Messiah be both king and priest? The order of Melchizedek. A precedent had been set there in Genesis 14, verse 18. God had ordained this, that Abram, Abraham had, had rescued, Abram had rescued Lot and all of Sodom. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Melchizedek shows up and he is called the king of Salem. Salem meaning peace. Well, God is the one who authors peace. This is not God. This is not Jesus in the Old Testament, but he's a representative of who Jesus will be. And he's also called the priest of God most high, a king and a priest. And he shows up without genealogy, an outsider, no, not from the family of Aaron, coming before the family of Aaron. And he is a representative that there is an order of priesthood that is both king and priest that is not something that humans will participate in. We can only demonstrate it through symbols. So this is a, a, not only a different priesthood, it is a better one. Look at how Paul describes it in Hebrews 7 verse 16, just a couple of words, that the Messiah's authority is according to the power of an endless life. Mm. And here it is, you will be priest forever. Mm. You will not transfer your priesthood to another person as the high priest had to do there. Aaron, when he died, it transferred then to his son. And each priest who died, that authority was transferred to his son or to another priest. Jesus doesn't do that. Mm. His priesthood is eternal. It, can, it covers everything. It lasts forever. And those priests on earth, those humans, they offered bulls and goats and lambs that could not take away sin, mm -hmm. the high priest then offers himself a real sacrifice that it was pointing toward to that was complete and effective and for all time. Oh, we're going to get all the way to the end of this. Mm. Now verse five, speaking about the Messiah, his kingly and priestly role. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. The Messiah now is no longer seated, he's arisen. He's a conquering king who does not remain in heaven. But there is a day coming, a day of wrath, a final day of wrath, when there is a return to bring to full, final, complete, absolute, finished completion what he was assigned to do, to make your enemies your footstool all enemies of God that we face, that we see, that we don't see, everything that comes from the power and the results of sin, all of them will be made his footstool under his feet, under complete subjection. subjection. All right, so this has been God's divine plan all along, witnessed and heard in advance.
He does this. Verse 6, he shall judge among the nations, he shall fill the places with dead bodies, he shall execute the heads of many countries. This is a heavy verse, but we see now the conclusion of it all, and it's sobering. Sin does bring death. This is the righteous judgment that has been God's plan. The work of the king, the work of the priest are united to bring salvation and put an end to sin forever. The Messiah's authority is above all, but we're not done. There's more. Verse 7, he shall drink of the brook by the wayside, therefore he shall lift up the head. The brook, this is peaceful, this is living water, this is the judgment concluded, sin no more, death no more, violence no more, it's all gone. The Messiah is refreshed, his volunteers are refreshed, and lift up the head. The Messiah's head is lifted up for all to see his victory, and he lifts up the head of his volunteers. Look, look, sin is gone, victory is attained. Join me in the kingdom of righteousness. Amen. 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 Thank you, Daniel, so much. We've just got a couple minutes left for final comments. On Monday, we look at the suffering Messiah. And you know, we're counseled to spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ. And I just want to encourage you, you might say, I don't have an hour, but spend time every day mm -hmm. focused on the life of Christ, especially those closing moments. Amen. Amen. The seed is introduced in Genesis 3:15. the seed of the woman. This is the Messiah. And there's a progressive unfolding of his story all throughout scripture. And guess what? Once we are born again, we become Amen. the seed of the Lord. So get into this lesson, you'll love it. Amen. And from the lesson, I bring you this thought. Because of the cross, the promise of the kingdom is assured. And Psalm 212, blessed are those who put their trust in the king. As I prepared for this lesson, I, I picked up Psalm 110 and I turned it over and looked at it from every side and it took my breath away mm -hmm. as I said, Lord, show me Jesus. Mm -hmm. Show me what you are like. And you can do this with every chapter of the Bible. Show me Jesus. Amen, amen. I am very excited to study uh, Psalm 110. Psalm 69, verses 3 and 4. Let's just look at this in closing. This is again is a Psalm of Christ. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They, they that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. This is our Savior. He stepped into our place. He restored that which we had taken away by being deceived by the devil. He stepped in to be our Savior to fulfill the everlasting covenant. Next week, we're going to be looking at uh, lesson number 10, which is entitled Lessons for of the Past. Lessons of the Past. God bless you till then.